All right, guys, uh, I think we're about ready to get started today. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm Kelly Hattori, and today I have the pleasure of co-hosting um, Adam Simon from the University of Michigan. Uh, so I'm really glad to have an in-person talk um, this late in the semester. We're really excited to have you here, Adam. And um, so today is April 29th. And uh, before we get started, before we get the introduction done and everything, I just want to remind you guys um, some admin stuff in case you don't make it to the end. Uh, first of all, next week, our speaker has um, unfortunately had to cancel, so we currently do not have a speaker to fill that slot. Um, we've been trying to find somebody, but uh, this is your opportunity. If you have a talk that we'd love to give, we would love to have you, so please reach out to myself or Amadi Haddad, um, and we'll try and get you slide in. Otherwise, uh, there will be no speaker next week. Uh, and as a reminder, please hold your questions until the end. If you think you're going to forget your question, write it in the chat box. We'll get to you guys uh, at the end of the talk uh, as in order that we hear the questions. So um, with that, I would like to turn uh, it over to Tristan Childress, who is currently on Zoom, hopefully, and he's yeah. the introduction for Adam. Pretending to pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Um, uh, glad you're here on this happy Friday. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my my thesis advisor from the University of Michigan, Adam C. Simon. Uh, Adam is a Arthur F. Thurno Professor of the Earth Environmental Sciences at the University of Michigan. He earned his bachelor and PhD in geology and geochemistry from the University of Maryland and his master of science in geochemistry from Stony Brook University. Adam was a postdoctoral fellowship at the John Hopkins, John, Johns Hopkins University, where he investigated the formation of layered mafic intrusions in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Adam spent his first seven years as a faculty member of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he helped develop a new genetic model that explains the formation of carlin-type gold deposits. Adam moved to the University of Michigan in 2012, where he and his research team investigated the formation of critical metal mineral deposits, including iron oxide, copper, gold, iron oxide, apatite, and porphyry systems. He is a fellow of the Society of Economic Geologists. Adam has mentored 27 graduate students, 74 undergraduate students, co-authored two textbooks titled Mineral Resources, Economics in the Environment, and Earth Materials, Components of a Diverse Planet, and published nearly 60 papers in the field of mineral resources. And so with that, Adam, I'll uh, let you take it away. I'm excited to, to see what you've been up to. All right, thanks, Tristan. Adam, Adam would you just please sign his thesis? I will, yeah. <laughs> so do I need to stand here for people to see me in the Zoom world? Like, are they seeing me through the webcam or is there another camera? Okay, okay, perfect. Okay. So, so for those of you who didn't hear, a few minutes ago, when Scott and Claudia came in, I said, I'm preaching to the choir. And I think Claudia said, we don't sing. And here's the takeaway today. We as geologists need to start singing and we need to start singing loudly. We are losing the trust of society in terms of the value that we add to society. So the talk I wanna give today, I wanna make it more conversational. I've got six PhD students and two postdocs, and I've got a postdoc who would love to give a talk next Friday if that slot is open, focused on the evolution of gold porphyry deposits in Chile. And my, my PhD students and postdocs are all working on various aspects of mineral resources, which when I talk to people outside of geology and contextualize for them, it's where do we find the copper and the lithium and the gold and the silver and the platinum group elements that are woven into the fabric of modern society? We invented the science of climate change and we forget that. We don't take ownership of that. If you go back to the 1950s and 1960s and you look at the seminal work of Dick Holland, formerly at Princeton and then Harvard, Dick Holland and other economic geologists, us in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s, they were baffled by banded iron formations, could not explain these unbelievably large volumes slash masses of oxidized iron. How did they form? How could they form considering the low solubility of iron in today's oceans? And as a result, Dick and others ideated what we now think of as routine oxygen fugacity or the partial pressure of oxygen. They ideated and essentially invented our understanding of the great oxidation events in the Proterozoic. So 
we had in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, as economic geologists, we had a lot of respect in society globally because we were seen as the people who found the resources to make modern society tick. And then we went off the trail, we went off the, 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 the tracks. And today we're vilified. And one of the things that I've done at the University of Michigan, and I'm excited and interested to talk with Claudia and Scott at lunch, one of the things I've done at Michigan is I've completely reformatted the way that I teach my undergraduate courses. I teach my undergraduate courses for the average undergraduate, which means most of the students who enroll in my courses are not natural science majors. I don't want them to be natural science majors. I wanna teach courses to the students who as young adults will vote because their vote matters more than whether they understand how a porphyry ore deposit forms or how a particular type of mineral deposit forms. And at the University of Michigan, I struggled to convince my colleagues in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences that that's what we should do. And as a result, at the University of Michigan, our department is not looked upon as the department that fundamentally plays a critical role in producing students at both the undergraduate and graduate level, who in essence will be on the front line solving the climate crisis. Right, we are the ones that will solve the climate crisis. Tristan coming here to work for BEG, Andres and others here working for BEG, the people that work for the mining companies finding these resources, they're fundamentally on the front line. And I think we have as economic geologists sort of shriveled and we've been somewhat afraid to announce that's who we are, that's what we do, and we've got to do that. And so my mission today, if I accomplish nothing else, is to try and convince your leadership that that's what your faculty should do. We don't need more classes for four graduate students that take an entire faculty member's semester. That's a waste of time. We need classes where faculty are teaching 100, 200, 300, 400 students and wowing the undergraduate, undergraduates at UT Austin so that the students leave that class with, holy shit, that is awesome. Yes, there are disasters. Yes, there are mine tailings ponds that collapse. Absolutely. But look at the other 99.9999999% of mining operations that we need and we want. We just at the beginning of the class don't know that. So I'm gonna walk through today and sort of make that pitch. And for those who are on Zoom, I'm always accessible to have a conversation. I'm always happy to share my slides. And this is how I start my undergraduate classes. And Scott, I don't think your daughter, has she graduated yet? She is senior. Okay, so she had, actually she won't have the opportunity to take a class with me, unless she wants to go to Camp Davis in June. I'm teaching my energy class at Camp Davis. And you can probably afford the out-of-state tuition. It, brother. Not to put you on the spot. So tell your daughter, June 9, July 2nd. So here's where I start my classes. Where did the Industrial Revolution begin? Right? Where did it start? You look at a map of the world, right? And you say, if we go back a few hundred years, where did it start? Started in England. Why did it start in England? Wasn't random, right? It could have started in Namibia, could have started in Australia, could have started somewhere else. But why did it start in England? It started in England because of the confluence of several really important ingredients that were required for the Industrial Revolution to happen. One of which was coal seams that outcropped at the surface. And we knew hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago, that what's shown here in the histogram, the energy density of coal is greater than the energy density of wood. So on a mass per mass basis, you extract more energy when you combust coal than you do when you combust wood. So England had these coal seams that outcropped at the surface. So geology was critical. Second, England, among all countries, allowed individuals to patent their intellectual property. No other country at the time allowed individuals to actually file with the government a patent for something that I ideated. And I tell every undergraduate, whether you like it or dislike it, you should read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, right? So, we have England with coal that outcrops at the surface. 
We have the ability for people to ideate and patent their intellectual property. And we also had boredom, right? Everybody who's read about Newton and his ideation of calculus, how did he have that time? Because the Black Plague went through Europe. And so he was sent home from Woolthorpe, which was the bougie private school he attended. And as he's living in boredom, escaping the city where he likely would have contracted the Black Plague, that boredom allowed him to ideate what we now call calculus, right? So these were really critical at allowing the Industrial Revolution to happen. And when you look at the map on the right-hand side of the slide here, again, it wasn't simply by chance. When you look at where the Industrial Revolution happened, meaning on the ground, the physical infrastructure, the cities where those factories were built, those cities were built because A, they were near the coal seams. So you could use that coal to drive steam engines. Thomas Newcomen in 1712 patented what we now think of as the steam engine. And then Watt after him perfected that. But these cities were either near coal fields or they were near tributaries where you could export goods and you could import goods. So geology was the critical determining factor. And as a result of the combustion of coal, which Newcomen and then others used as the source of energy for his steam engine, his steam engine was built to do what? Does anybody know? Pump water out of? Out of underground mines, exactly. So he ideated this concept that we now call the steam engine to dewater underground mines. And as a result, factories started to flourish when they realized they could also use the steam engine to build looms and other things that did what? It did the work of many humans in a much smaller amount of time. We then see the growth of coal. We see the growth of oil. Oil, why did that come on the scene? We've known about oil as a species for probably tens of thousands of years. But in the 1850s and 1860s, people like Benjamin Silliman Jr., who was a professor of chemistry at Yale, figured out that if you take crude oil and you heat it up, you can fractionate the individual hydrocarbons. And when you fractionate those individual hydrocarbons, you can pull out kerosene, which replaced whale blubber. Right? Talk about a major impact on job sectors. If you look at how many men and teenage boys were employed hunting whales off the coast of New England in the 1700s and early 1800s until we now could use oil. And we used oil because it has a high energy density, much higher than coal, much higher than wood. We look at Henry Ford, give or take 120 years ago, Henry Ford ideated mass production of vehicles. We then look at Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill did lots of things during his life. Among the reason he played a pivotal role for economic geology is Winston Churchill was in charge of the British Navy during World War I. And during World War I, Winston Churchill authorized the British Navy to switch from using coal to oil as the fuel, which allowed the British Navy to have superiority over the Germans. So you could travel faster, farther, and you emitted less soot when you combusted coal, when you combusted oil relative to coal. And as a result, every Navy on the planet transitioned. As a result, the collective we went into the Middle East. So 1909 was the birth of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And again, it was patent law. It was an Englishman who figured out that there was near surface oil in what is modern day Iran. He put pipes in the ground, from those pipes came oil at almost zero cost. And as a result of England wanting to use that oil to power their Navy, all bets were off. And the race to find oil in the Middle East took off. And this is the birth of what is now British Petroleum, BP. We as a society today use one of the fractional products or one of the hydrocarbons from oil as petrol or gasoline. And the reason we use it is the same reason we've used wood and the same reason we use coal. If you take a simple molecule like isooctane, which is one of the molecules in oil, add a little oxygen, give it a little spark, it releases a lot of energy. In addition to, re to releasing a lot of energy, it also releases carbon dioxide and water, two gases that we know work to trap radiation in Earth's atmosphere. And when all of this is happening, society is changing. 
And today we think about changing, right? The transition to carbon neutrality. Can it happen? Will it happen? How fast it can happen? So these two slides are gonna show you how fast we transitioned from horse and buggy. So this is 1900 New York City, Fifth Avenue. At that time in the United States and the modern day European Union, there were roughly 100 to 150,000 humans, men, who had a job six days a week building horse carriages. Over 100,000 people, that was their job, building horse carriages. How many of you in the room, by show of hands, know somebody today who wakes up on a Monday morning and goes in to build a horse carriage? Nobody, right? That job sector completely was eliminated, and it happened in little more than a decade. So if we look at 1900, New York City, Fifth Avenue, everybody except for one person right here, this is the only combustion engine vehicle in the slide. 13 years later, there's nobody using a horse and buggy. And at the time, in the absence of understanding the irreversible reaction of producing carbon dioxide in water and what that might do to Earth's atmosphere and oceans, this was seen as a phenomenal positive step for public health because prior to the combustion engines taking over New York City and other cities around the world, think about how much horse poop literally covered the streets, right? And we think of it as night soil, right? At night, there were armies of men who would come in and literally scoop the poop. And then they would sell that to farmers to use for fertilizer. It also resulted in contamination of drinking water. So there are horrific examples of wells in New York City and Boston and Baltimore and Dublin and London, horrific contamination. But we changed overnight and it was viewed as a positive. It also allowed us to completely change the way we grow food. So if you look at the combine on the right, if you've, ever, if you've never had a chance to get up in a combine, you should do it. Combines are beasts and it's not just a man thing. Combines are beasts. Today, combines are fully air conditioned or heated. You're in a super comfy, super comfy leather seat, right? It's got you know, some sort of shocks on it so it moves around when you move. They can be satellite guided so you can literally almost fall asleep while they're moving around. And all I want you to take away here, especially today when we're talking about the impact of the decline of wheat exports from Russia and Ukraine on the global food availability, is we now farm in a few minutes what it used to take everybody in our room here, all 25 of us, all day. We'd wake up, the rooster would be crowing, we'd wake up, we'd go out, we'd farm all day long, we'd come back. This combine does it in a few minutes. And that has allowed us to grow our global population. So if you look up here at the top, you can see from 1900 through 2015, Global population increased from slightly under 2 billion to now we're approaching 8 billion people within the next couple of decades. And you can see fossil fuel consumption perfectly tracks with global population increase. And I'm not saying right now this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's a clear correlation, right? If we look at the bottom, we can also see that as global population increased, as fossil fuel consumption increased, gross domestic product, which is not a perfect, but it's a way that economists measure the impact of national economies, gross domestic product or economic productivity increased around the world. Life expectancy increased, right? I asked undergraduates, what was the life expectancy 100 years ago? Does anybody know? 100 years ago, if you were born, on average, what was your life expectancy? Yeah, it was 50. So I turned 50 this year. And lovingly, one of my kids a few years ago at a birthday said something such, something along the lines of, you know, dad, this is great. You're one day closer to death. And I said, aren't we all? Every day you wake up, you're one day closer to death. So 100 years ago, 50 was the average lifespan. Today, when we look around the world, and COVID had a negative impact on this, but it's a blip on the radar. When we look around the world, life expectancy has almost doubled in 100 years. That's phenomenal. Why? Because of a number of factors. Among them, maternal mortality has significantly declined. 
So if we go back 100, 200, 300 years, on average, one out of three to four women would die during childbirth. Die, straight up die. Child mortality was also incredibly high. Right? We've gone through the last couple of years with this big vax versus anti-vax campaign and people battling on that front. A hundred plus years ago, on average, one out of every few kids who was born died before the age of five. Right? I mean, we literally would have kids shit themselves to death because of contaminated water from wells all over the world where horses were the primary source of transportation. The number of people living in poverty has declined significantly significantly. Now, there are certainly poor people around the world, and there is variability in terms of the economic progress that's been made around the world. But in general, if we look at the data over the last 200 years, we have roughly quadrupled the population of the world, and everybody who's been added does not live in extreme poverty. That's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal that we could go from roughly 2 billion to 8 billion, and those new 6 billion people are not living in poverty. Now, we still have poverty issues to address, but what we can see here is the number of people living in poverty is declining globally. We have ideated, and again, Britain was the first country to allow us to patent intellectual property. The United States and other countries quickly followed. We've ideated things such as seat belts and airbags. I tell my undergraduates, I grew up in North Carolina and I can remember when seat belts became the law and everybody had a bitch fit. You can't tell me I have to wear a seat belt. I don't know anybody in my hometown in North Carolina today who doesn't willingly put a seat belt on. It's just common sense. Then airbags came out. Everybody today has airbags. And as a result, we're driving far more than we drove a hundred years ago and we're driving much safer. We work less. No matter what we think, we work less. Okay? The standard work week 100 years ago was six days. And it was six days dawn to dusk, with Sunday being, in general, the Sabbath. Right? There are very few places where that's done today. Right? Israel is among the countries where I have collaborators where their work week starts on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. and it goes until Friday at 2 p.m. Right? We don't do that anymore. The weekend is sacrosanct. Everybody takes off the weekend. We work less. And among the reasons we work less is we have technology and tools, courtesy of the Industrial Revolution, that do the work much faster and in most cases much better than humans used to do. So by now you've read the text on the right side of the slide. This is at the Baltimore Museum of Art on the campus of the Johns Hopkins University of Baltimore. And again, I mentioned 100,000 plus people that used to make horse buggies, harnesses, carriages. We used to have more than 100,000 blacksmiths. Where are they now? How many people know a blacksmith? Right? How many people, when you want something that is made of steel, you actually go to a blacksmith who forges that for you? Nobody. You go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, you go to Walmart, boom, there it is. Or you literally in your pajamas order it from Amazon and in most cities, it will be delivered the same day that you ordered it. So all of these blacksmiths, that entire economy is gone. So we see massive economic change. We don't raise our sons and daughters to build these anymore. We don't need to. We see impacts on literacy. So if you look here top and bottom, on Sunday, I'm flying to Turkey and Egypt and South Africa, South Africa to give some short courses. And look here at the top and bottom, right? The colors are different. The numbers are the percentage of people who are considered by the United Nations literate. What drives that, right? This is back to the origins of BP and the Anglo-Iranian oil company. It's the wealth from resource extraction, not perfect, not without problems, but it's the wealth transfer of the resource extraction from these countries that God endowed with natural gas and oil that has resulted in building new K-12 and university infrastructure. And as a direct result of our consumption of those fossil fuels, and that's key, it's the consumption of those fossil fuels by those of us who live in the historically defined more developed countries. 
that has resulted in completely mobilizing the college age demographic throughout the Middle East and North Africa. That's radical when you think about the speed with which that's, this has changed. I mentioned we work less, we have more leisure time. And for all of the female participants watching, you know exactly why men have more leisure time. Women don't golf. Right? The University of Michigan has two 18 hole golf courses. I've proposed we convert those to utility scale solar. But you know who doesn't want that? It's all the old white rich men who golf, right? We have more leisure time. Now, this one I'm gonna build out in a few slides. And I take my time when I use this in classes with my undergraduates. And by the way, I've borrowed these from Steven Pinker at Harvard who had these in a book a few years ago called Enlightenment Now. So we've got on the X axis, the bottom here time, give or take the last century. On the left Y axis is the hours of housework per week. Now that means housework. That doesn't mean work to earn money from an outside source. That means doing your laundry, cooking, cleaning, gardening, you name it, butchering animals, right? Scott, you've been to Michigan, you know, the diag that everybody thinks is so amazing. At the University of Michigan, there's this plot of land that everybody thinks of as old growth forest. But if you look at paintings of that area in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were cows and pigs and they were butchered and served in the dining halls. I have advocated for that as the ultimate farm to table and think it would be great for students who are not vegetarian now to learn how to do that. And I'd be willing to bet the number of vegetarians, I've been one for 30 years, would instantaneously increase. But hours of housework per week, how many hours do you think it took to run a household 100 years ago? 10, 15, 20? 30, okay? And why do we work less now? First is access to electricity. So the access to electricity in the United States and other more developed countries is 100%. Now there are issues, there are challenges, regulatory issues in the state of Michigan, we have regulated utilities. And right now there's a fight between one of our regulated utilities and the state because they wanna increase the rate that people pay for electricity. But we've gone from zero electricity to 100% electricity. And the red line shows you the impact on that with respect to the hours per week we work. Look at that, think about it. Think about life without any of these technologies. No washer, no dryer, no microwave, no oven, right? Imagine waking up where you went to the outhouse out back and then you had to get wood and then you brought the wood in, and then you had to combust that wood, and then you had to heat that water, the water that you got because you had to hand drill the well somewhere on your property, right? So along with consumption of fossil fuels, we now have 100% access to electricity, and electricity is what makes all of these technologies work for us, which leads to more leisure time, less time that we actually have to work, it also leads to, and I'll show you these separately, on the left side over here, the y-axis is percent electrified, and the x-axis is year. And all I want you to see on the right, you can see a variety of countries, Brazil to Vietnam, is for each of these countries, their access to electricity has gone from zero to 100% in only a couple of generations. And that has correlated with, on the right, the average GDP, economic output dramatically increased. And as a result, we have longer lifespans, mortality rates for pregnant women and children have dramatically declined. We see this when we look at the human development index. So here on the left is the human development index. Other people look at this as sort of a happiness index and you can come up with different ways to quantify the impact of our access to energy. But if you look at per capita primary power consumption on the x-axis, there's a clear cause and effect between the access to energy and its impact on our lives. And so we see countries up here that have a very high human development index. Think of our lifestyles, our access to education, our access to healthcare. It's not perfect, but I'll tell you what, compared to my great grandparents, it's pretty darn good. So are there negative consequences? Absolutely. 
right? The red line shows you the amount of carbon that has been titrated or added to Earth's atmosphere as a result of the combustion of coal, oil, and natural gas over the last couple hundred years. And this is really simple as a mass balance, right? We know how much coal we've combusted. We know how much oil we've extracted. We know how much natural gas we've extracted. And then it's just simply mass balancing how much carbon we've titrated into the atmosphere. And that's shown as the red, right? And I've never met anybody who disagrees with me on this. Doesn't matter how they vote, if they pray, who they pray to, right? This is basic, basic information. As a result, of all of that excess carbon now in the atmosphere as a result of combustion of fossil fuels. We see again here, I'll trace over fossil fuel consumption over the last 120 years. And then we see global average surface temperatures have increased, right? And there's wiggle in these data, right? These are based on collecting data on the surface around the world. In some parts of the world, we have high density temperature data. In some parts of the world, we have low density temperature data. And there's interpolation and there's variability owing to natural processes. But it's inescapable that this is a cause and effect. Okay? And then on the bottom, we see what I showed you in the last slide is just carbon. Here's global atmospheric CO2. And we understand really well how molecules of CO2 and water and methane in the atmosphere, they trap that long wave radiation that's re-radiated from the surface when incoming short wave radiation hits the surface. The collective we have known about this for a long time. So this is a plot from a study internal to Exxon in the 19 year, 82. And what they did is they simply said, okay, if we combust oil, we combust natural gas, we combust coal, and that irreversibly releases carbon as carbon dioxide, we can project forward based on some assumptions of how much fossil fuel we will combust over the next several decades. And the red line here shows you the y-axis is atmospheric CO2. The x-axis is year 1960, 1980, 2000, 2020. Their prediction was spot on. Scientists at Exxon were really smart people. They are smart people, right? So again, everybody agrees with these data. We know by combustion of fossil fuels, we're adding carbon to the atmosphere. When we look at our global energy budget, one of the things that's also critical for people to do is make sure you educate students and the general public between the difference of primary versus secondary energy. Secondary energy is the electricity we consume. That's one form. Primary energy is all of the, just that, primary sources of energy. And when we look around the world, we see that coal and oil and natural gas dominate primary energy. So when AOC and Senator Markle, they come out with the Green New Deal, which sounds fantastic, right? Sounds great. My read of that is they didn't fundamentally understand the difference between primary and secondary energy. It's easier if we're only talking about switching over our electric grid as, as, it, as it exists now to one that primarily relies on renewable energy. It's a much harder challenge to completely eliminate all of the fossil fuels that we use for transportation and industrial purposes, agriculture, than it is just for the secondary electricity we consume. So we have a world dominated by coal, oil, and natural gas. I just showed you this, so I'm not gonna stick on it, but what does that mean, right? This is where, when I look around the room, automatically I can tell you, among my students, who was raised in a family of climate skeptics, or climate deniers, climate change skeptics, climate change deniers, because it's not tangible. What does this mean? Huh? Big whoop, right? I've lived in Michigan for 10 years and people say, oh, there's less snow today. Isn't that fantastic? No, here's what's tangible. This is what resonates. In the state of Michigan, where apples are a major crop, in the state of Georgia, where peaches are an important and major crop, all of these fruit trees require what we call chill time in the winter. The winter temperatures have to get just low enough so that the fruit trees will bear fruit in the summers. So if we have winters that are slightly warmer, that negatively impacts the crop yields in the summers. 
And we're already seeing this when you look at peat shields in Georgia. And the forecast is in the next one to two generations, peaches won't grow in Georgia. Apples won't grow in Michigan. We see that with respect to wheat. So if we think of America's bread basket, you're looking here at what is the current region where wheat is grown and where wheat is forecast to be grown in 2050. It's in Canada, right? So Biden proposes $33 billion in aid for Ukraine. And part of that $33 billion is actually to increase productivity of wheat and other farmed goods in the United States. Within the next 30 years, we won't have temperatures that are suitable for growing wheat. This is tangible. This is where I can connect with students who initially are skeptical of climate change. Is it really a crisis? Because what they say to me is they see faculty preaching climate crisis, but those faculty are driving a combustion engine. They're heating their home with natural gas. So can it really be a crisis? So we have to make it tangible. We have to make it something people can latch onto. And I've had students from Georgia who know peach farmers where this is real. I've had students in Michigan who know apple farmers for whom this is real, right? This is what matters to people because this hits the checkbook. And we see the same thing around the world. So red means bad. Everywhere that you see red, red is bad. And when you look around the world, what the red colors indicate is everywhere, we're gonna see temperatures changing such that wheat yields, other types of grain yields, rice yields, potato yields, peanut yields will decline. So how do we stop this? Carbon neutrality. This is what we hear being preached in DC by Democrats and preached by Democrats around the country and around the world. But what does it mean? Seems simple, right? You call up CVS and you say, you know, can I pick up a little carbon neutrality around two? And the pharmacist says, oh yeah, sure. Do you want 20 pills or do you want a 90 day supply? What does it actually mean, right? So the key is you have to present climate change in a way that it's tangible for the general public. And then you have to break down carbon neutrality. What does it mean, right? It requires we electrify everything. And by everything, we electrify everything except for airplanes, because there is no way on God's green earth you're going to fly an airplane with a nuclear reactor or lithium ion batteries or whatever may come after lithium ion batteries. The mass is just too great. Okay? So we have to electrify everything, which means all of the primary energy we have to convert. So what do we do, right? Students see this picture right away and they think like, oh, this is amazing. I'm gonna graduate from the University of Michigan. Today we're having graduation ceremonies. I'm gonna go out and buy myself a Tesla. And my immediate response is, that's awesome. I want you to go out and buy a Tesla or another electric vehicle. Why? Because yes, it will have a positive impact on climate. It also is adding jobs. But the jobs are different than the ones that are commonly talked about in the popular press, building renewable energy, electricity infrastructure. When I look at a Tesla, what do I see? What does everybody in this room see, right? It's like Stephen Marshak in his textbooks used to have this thing, you know, what does a geologist see when you look at an outcrop? When I look at a Tesla, here's what I see. I see the aluminum and bauxite that has to be mined. I see titanium that has to be mined. I see boron that has to be mined. Carbon has to be mined. Copper has to be mined. Rare earth metals have to be mined. Plastic, we still need plastic. Does it come from oil or natural gas or will we use algae to produce plastic? It still doesn't grow anywhere, so it has to be made. We see silicon and carbon fiber and copper wire in the cars. Then we get to the battery packs and students are always confused on this. Lithium ion batteries, they think it's only lithium. Well, what about the graphite and the aluminum, right? We have anodes and cathodes. We have a separator between the anode and cathode. We have salt. So we need lots of other metals, nickel, that go into making lithium ion batteries. If I only focus on copper and you compare from left to right, 
a conventional combustion engine vehicle right now is somewhere between 20 and 50 pounds of copper contained within the vehicle. We don't see it, but every time you get into a combustion engine vehicle and turn it on, there's electricity that's moving. And that copper is where those electrons are moving. If we move to having everybody drive an EV, notice that we now have 183 pounds of copper. That's a massive increase if we take the give or take billion cars on the roads around the world today, if we have everybody's on an electric bus. So what I see when I look at carbon neutrality are all the resources we need. And I'm gonna skip this one, but just to highlight, we need lots of resources for every type of renewable energy, right? Wind turbines, every commercial scale, one and a half megawatt capacity wind turbine needs about four tons of copper, needs neodymium, needs samarium, okay? Every time you look at a solar panel, it's not just the glass, but you need phosphorus and boron that make that solar panel to create the ability to have current flow. And so students need to be aware of these tangible things that we have to provide. One of the things also working in our favor is the general public in the US, and this is true in more developed countries around the world, everybody when they're polled door to door is on board with more renewable energy. It's only when you get people together in groups where you'll have people who come out opposed to renewable energy, but everybody's on board. If we look at where and why renewable energy in terms of electricity production has really taken off, it's in the Midwest and Texas. Texas is part of the Midwest. You classify yourself as part of the Midwest, you're separate, right? There's the Midwest and then there's, and then there's Texas. So, so in Texas and the northern part of the United States, the Midwest, renewable energy has taken off, not simply because there's an abundance of wind or there's an abundance of sunlight, but because generating electricity with renewable energy is cheaper than generating electricity with any other technology, flat out. And so if we look at where renewable energy has taken off, this is the Midwest and Texas. Right, the state of Iowa, where my oldest daughter went to college, roughly six out of 10 electrons are coming from wind. Right? Texas is crushing it. We see a few Democrat leaning states, you know, out here, Oregon's doing okay, Maine is doing okay, Vermont's doing okay, but you don't see this in Michigan. You don't see it in what we would think of as traditional blue states. There's a lot of opposition. We saw even under the Trump administration, a big push for more renewable energy infrastructure development. And this is one that's near and dear to me because my father and ancestors, they used to farm potatoes out here on the North Fork of Long Island. There are no potato farms there anymore. Now it's all bougie wineries with Sunday morning jazz for people who come out from Manhattan for the weekend. But this is a wind, wind farm here, one and two, that were proposed and permitted by the Trump administration by Equinor, formerly Stat Oil, that will generate, give or take, each of these two will generate about a gigawatt capacity. And so they're enough to provide power for probably two to two and a half million homes in the greater New York area. This is me, and this is my wife on the left side in Ann Arbor, Michigan, All right? And again, I show this because Lots of people hear me preaching renewable energy and they say, oh, but in Michigan, you can't do this. In Michigan, it's just not, it's not possible. But these are solar panels that I ordered from a company in Massachusetts who brought them in from China. These are batteries, simplify batteries, iron, phosphor, lithium batteries. And I've got six of them. And I use solar to charge these batteries. I've got a natural gas generator as a backup. And every day my wife drives a Tesla Y, beautiful car. Trust me, if you've got any part of your brain that says, I'm not sure I would like an EV, I can in 60 seconds eliminate that from your mind, okay? Because among many other things, I mentioned the horse poop. How many people in here, picture it. How many people in here when you're driving, you see people pick their nose. They scratch parts of their body that you know you don't wanna know where they're scratching. And then what do they do? They pump gas with the same hand without washing it. And then you pump gas. Oh yeah. And so 
the ability to simply drive home every day and just plug in. I've never once had Alicia say to me, you know, Adam, I miss going to the gas station. Those were such happy times. I really enjoyed going to the gas station and putting my hand on that disgusting gas nozzle, especially in Michigan's winter when it's freezing cold and I'm standing outside, doesn't happen. So the reason EVs are gonna take over fundamentally has nothing to do in my opinion with climate change crisis. crisis. It has to do with simplicity. There's no oil, you don't need an oil change. The only thing you have to do with an EV is make sure you rotate and balance your tires every 5,000 miles. That's what people forget to do because most people with a combustion engine vehicle, you rotate and balance your tires when you get an oil change. You don't get an oil change with an EV, so simple. And you can charge these. We don't have a, a, a stage two charger at home. This is just a trickle charge. That's all we need. That's all you would need even in Austin, five, 10, 15 miles a day in an EV, that's all you need. And I think I've seen outside here, don't you have EV chargers? Yeah. So where do we get all the metals? This is what I mean by we have to start singing. This ain't reality, right? I think I have colleagues at the University of Michigan who somehow imagine in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, this is reality, right? And, and I've not yet found it. I keep asking my colleagues. I've, I've done research on seven continents, about 60 countries. I've traveled extensively and I keep looking. Right? I keep looking for the panels, the solar panels growing at the organic orchard. Right? Like I imagine this in the fall. Wouldn't it be amazing? Right? It's in the fall. I have four kids. They're all my sons are taller than me now, so they're but they're still kids. Could you imagine, right? Like you take your grandkids, one day I'll have grandkids. Like, you know, let's go to the apple orchard and you pick the apples. You're like, oh, these apples are so great. Oh, look, there's a solar panel. Let's pick that off the tree. Isn't God wonderful? Right? She's really smart but this isn't how she makes solar panels available to us. They come out of the ground. This is what a solar panel looks like at the beginning of the supply chain, right? It's a big hole in the ground where we extract copper and we make that copper available. This is where we need to start singing in a way that resonates with the general public and with politicians. Why does that hole in the ground exist? It's not that geologists are evil, horrible, nasty people. Well, maybe some are, but not most of us. It's a hole in the ground that exists because that copper is in this. This lifestyle depends on that copper. If we want this lifestyle, we look at big holes in the ground like Bingham Canyon. If you ever fly to Salt Lake City and you have about a six hour layover, you can get to Bingham Canyon. It's about 20 miles southwest of the airport. It is either number one or number two biggest hole in the world. Chuki Kamada in Chile claims that it's slightly bigger and I won't get into that debate here, but it's four kilometers side to side. This hole in the ground literally allowed for the economic prosperity of the Mormon faith, right? Again, connections. I've had students from Utah at the University of Michigan. I had students from Utah at UNLV when I taught there. And if you look back at religious history, why did the Mormons settle in Salt Lake? It was because the federal government decided that Colorado to the east was valuable because we had already tripped over veins of silver and copper and gold there. So the federal government wanted Colorado. Nevada, state motto is battle born. 19, 19, 1862, Nevada was absorbed into the Union. Why? Because of all of the silver that was being mined in Virginia City and other parts of Nevada. And Utah, at that time, the federal government basically thought, it's a shithole. Let's give it to this community. And there were people saying, is it Deseret? Is it Utah? What are we going to name it? And then this is named after the Bingham brothers, two brothers who moved to Utah in 1848 when the Mormons left Missouri and the Bingham brothers used to graze cattle here. And the next thing you know, humans tripped over gold, tripped over copper, tripped over silver, and this mine was born. And as a result, Salt Lake City's economy has prospered. Now there's a little bit of other stuff going on there, but it's great, right? We read about it in the Bible. Geologists, and I see this too much in our undergraduate and graduate students, somehow they have developed this idea that if they understand and appreciate religious history, somehow they're not, there's something wrong with them. 
right? Which, which I scratch my head because I've read the Bible cover to cover. And what I do is I tell students it's an historical text. And yes, there's you know, a little bit of Harry Potter woven in here and there. But when we look at the Bible, these are what we call the seven metals of antiquity. These are in the Old Testament, right? We've used these for thousands of years. We've used copper for thousands of years, right? This is copper, elemental copper. This is copper that was mined in a place called Great Orme in modern day England. And this is why, among other reasons, the Romans wanted to put legions in England because they wanted the copper, right? These are shafts. These are adits, drift mines. Four, five, six thousand years ago, humans were mining copper from behind these cliffs. Why? Because we saw this classic green patina on the surface, which indicated that there was copper in the rock. And so we, we started mining this. This is an ingot, right, from the Calcolithic period or the Copper Age, right? It changed humanity. It allowed empires to rise and fall, right? Copper, if you made tools out of copper, would beat stone. So we went from the Stone Age to the Copper Age. And then early geologists slash geochemists, we figured out that if you took that copper and you added about one part tin to copper, you lowered the melting temperature of the binary alloy and you could produce bronze. And in rock, paper, scissors or stone, copper, bronze, bronze won and bronze put Anatolia, bronze put Anatolia on the map. If you've ever heard about the Hittite empire, the Hittite empire became the Hittite empire because this part of modern day Turkey, that's where there is the evidence we first figured out how to make bronze, right? So the message I want everybody listening to me now is this is the stuff that resonates with students because this is the stuff about why we came from where we came from. And in the state of Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan is the first city in the United States, not Dearborn, Hamtramck is the first city in the United States where there's a majority Muslim city council. So we have a lot of students from, North, uh, from, from the Middle East and North Africa. This resonates. This is history. Every one of these little dots, it's not there by chance. It's there because we tripped over these resources, right? These are the Bronze Age tools that put the Hittite empire on the map. They established trade routes. So let me move through this quickly because I do want to leave a couple of minutes for discussion. So if this is a map of the ancient Middle East, this is the map of where resources come today. This is the modern day map of all the holes in the ground whether they're open pit or underground, this is where we source all the resources. And we need a lot more of them to make carbon neutrality reality, right? When we look at our consumption of every resource, it continues to increase. So in this slide, 1960s, the baseline year, we consume about 450% more iron ore today, year over year than we did in 1960. And that's what allowed cities like Shanghai this is Shanghai in 1987. This is Shanghai today, all right? The backbone is steel. We look at copper, copper's in everything. Everything that is electrified has copper. And we consume about 300% more copper now than we did in 1960 annually. Now, we need more copper. I walk students through what I've mentioned here, that we used to trip over ore deposits. The Industrial Revolution, coal in England, outcropped at the surface. Those days are gone. Finding metal deposits is much harder today. If we look at these slides where we've got depth on the y-axis on the y -axis here, so we'd be standing up here versus time. This shows you that over the last hundred years, all of the quote, easy to find metal deposits at the surface, we found them. And so now we have to rely on more sophisticated geophysical techniques to actually look into the subsurface to find mineral deposits. And as a result, this just shows you, I'm gonna skip it, come back later. This shows you the depth of cover. So all of that sediment on top of mineral deposits, right? As mineral deposits get deeper, meaning our ability to find them is deeper, there's more sediment on top. They become more expensive. We need geophysical methods, right? This is not new for the oil and gas industry, but it's new for the hard rock mining industry. And it's something that the collective we are now borrowing from the expertise in oil and gas, okay? 
it's getting more expensive. So the only number on this slide you need to take away is the average cost to discover a viable mineral deposit is pushing $200 million. Now that's sunk cost. That's money that has been spent without actually holding metal in your hand. And that's something important as well, right? That these companies who are searching for metal deposits, they are mortgaging tens to hundreds, some of them more than a billion dollars just to find a deposit. And as a result, I'll just show this one, all of these negative cash flow, the sunk costs, the average length of time right now in 2022 for me to go out and find a mineral deposit that contains copper and develop a mine infrastructure so that I hold copper in my hand, the average length of time is 16 years. 16 years, 16 years. All right. So when we think about, and this shows you here, right, for different types of mineral deposits, green fields and brown fields, right, the average is 16. That's a long time, right? Honestly, I'm 50, 34 seems like a long time ago. And 66, like God willing, seems like a long time out into the future, right? But my oldest daughter turns 24 next month. So she'll be 40. If I were to find a copper deposit now, she will be 40, right? But we want to electrify everything, right? That's how we solve the climate crisis. So is it possible to make this transition? It is. We've done it in the past. It's not the geology that limits us. It's the inability to convince the people who are most, who are screaming the loudest about climate change crisis, it's the inability to convince them that we need to do this quickly. Empire State Building, just to show 410 days. Can you build a house in Austin in 410 days? I mean, from the time you buy land, get permits, hire contractors, get inspectors, can you do that in a year? can't do it in Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, it's typically three to five years, right? And why? It's not because of the absence of resources per se. So we need to increase the amount of copper. Let me just skip through some of these. And we need to do it for all metals, right? So here we have copper, and then we have all of these other metals that are necessary for renewable energy. This is one. So this is supply over demand ratio. Anything less than one means that we are not making enough of that metal for mines to actually produce the renewable energy infrastructure. And these are my last couple of slides. And here's why I'm gonna tell you we're not gonna be able to do it unless there's a radical change in the mindset of the Democratic Party who are the most vocal about climate change crisis. This is called the Pebble Prospect okay, or Pebble Project in Alaska. If we zoom in, we, the collective we, have used a variety of geophysical techniques to find this little star on the map. And all I want you to see is that over the last 30 years, more than a billion dollars has been spent, a billion dollars of sunk cost, negative cash flow, to find a volume of earth that if we would allow it to be developed into a mine, it would rank in roughly the top 10 copper production on the planet. And in terms of total metals would be number one. Number one, this is what carbon neutrality requires. Like it's just, this is what carbon neutrality requires, but it won't be permitted. The Biden administration has decided not to permit it. The Trump administration didn't permit it. The Obama administration didn't permit it. Now, there are good reasons. It would require construction of a tailings pond for all of the mine waste that sits upstream of one of the world's most pristine salmon fisheries. So there's a lot of activism among indigenous communities for all the right reasons that we shouldn't allow Pebble to be developed. But it's a trade-off, isn't it? If you want carbon neutrality, which means electrify everything, you need 
lots of metals to make that happen. And those metals have to come from somewhere. And so our inability to convince the people for whom climate change is the crisis, this existential crisis limits us. And it's not, again, if we think of these sort of interlocking wheels, it's not the geology or the technical stuff that limits us. Yes, it takes 16 years by the time you discover to the time you produce. Most of those 16 years are permitting issues, environmental compliance issues, which all have their place, but have now become so hard, made it so hard for companies that few people are able to get the social license to mine, right? And this is our big challenge. We have a large group of people for whom climate change is a crisis. What are we gonna do? And there's a simple solution, electrify everything. To electrify everything, we need lots more mining activity but the same people for whom climate change is a crisis will not permit the mining activity, all right? So what do we do? I don't have the answer, but I'll leave with this slide here. This is not the answer, all right? And it's not my opinion, right? When we do the quote back of the envelope or even more sophisticated math on what does carbon neutrality require? It requires electrifying everything. And in order to electrify everything, we need more of all of the metals that will allow us to eliminate the consumption of the primary resources, coal, oil, and natural gas. In order to produce those metals, you have to mine. And there seems to be this massive disconnect in the Biden administration and other similar administrations for whom climate change is the crisis. And I, I am looking for what is the magic pill? How do you convince people that this is, it's not a necessary evil, but it's absolutely necessary we have to do it. And I'll finish by saying, going back to the beginning, I don't think on our campuses we do a good job. I don't think at the University of Michigan, our department does a good job of advertising, not just who we are, but what value do we add to society? Right, we should own carbon neutrality. We should own electrify everything, right? The Bureau of Economic Geology should own that for the state of Texas, right? Why should we mine more metals? Because a year ago, you all had a little snowstorm and lost power for several days. And I'm laughing because in Michigan, that was a little snowstorm. We wouldn't have canceled school. But down here, it was like, holy shit, God had a bad day. She was angry at Texas. But how do you avoid that in the future? Grid scale renewable energy, seriously, much better than building natural gas peaker plants. So how do we do it, right? I think as faculty for whom economic geology and geology in general is important, we have to do a better job of advocating that we add value to society. And we're gonna take some licks without a doubt, but we have to do it. And I think among the ways we can do this is by completely reimagining how we engage with undergraduates because they're the people who become the voters that vote in the politicians. And by changing the classes that we teach so that they actually are engaging for undergraduates. And I'll stop there, so I'm sure I'm over time. Great talk, Adam. Uh, Kelly, do you wanna Take it away. Yeah, so um, we are over time, um, but thank you again for an awesome presentation, Adam. Um, I think we can take like one or two questions and then they're gonna boot me off and I, okay. I have to go to another meeting. So um, we'll take one from in here. Yeah, Bo, yeah go ahead. I, I just have a quick question. Yeah. So for the for, for the project, Pebble project, and um, it appeared to me that, I mean, uh, the, we, we work on this project uh, to pro, uh, produce more metals and uh, to to protect the environment yeah to to uh, yep. avoid global warming and uh, on the other side and uh, for the for the local people they are against this project uh, also from the consideration of environment yep yeah so so i mean what's the trade-off point i mean like uh, to so that, that that's it right that's the conundrum is like yes building pebble or building any mine infrastructure creates a new risk 
the payoff, what's the, what's the payoff for that creation of the new risk, right? This mine in and of itself would go a long way to electrifying everything, right? Building renewable energy infrastructure throughout the United States and it's domestic, right? So this is, this is a libertarian Republican dream Right? You've got a massive mineral deposit in the United States. We own that. We don't have to involve other countries. We wouldn't have child labor. We'd have MSHA and OSHA overseeing it. So it would be overseen by the strictest regulations on the planet. What's wrong? The what's wrong is that if there is a failure of the tailings pond, it could have possibly irreversible impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. And this is an area not that far from where the Exxon Valdez spill happened in the early 1990s. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a choice, right? And everybody makes these choices all the time, right? You get in a car, your risk of dying just went up, right? Honestly, if you wake up in the morning, your risk of dying just went up, right? Because you're awake and you can die when you're awake. And I don't mean to sound silly, but again, I think it's, it's how do we contextualize the critical need for these mining projects, right? There's a reason that the US Congress declared this group of about 30 metals, critical metals, they're critical. And what I haven't figured out yet is how to crack the nut that is the group who are so adamant that we have to disconnect from fossil fuels. And when you present them with a solution, then they push back and say, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. And this is like my WTF moment, like, well, okay, then what's the option? The option then is that we increase production from, let's say, the Democratic Republic of Congo. No, no, no you can't do that because there's child labor. Okay, then we increase production from Chile in the Atacama Desert. No, 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 you can't do that. Like, what, where do you do it? Right? You have to do it somewhere. And again, I think this is where we have to plant the seed that over the next 10 to 20 years, the undergraduates we teach today will become the people who we elect in 10, 15, 20 years. I don't believe we have any questions through the chat. So if we are good Awesome, here, thank you. Um, then thank you again, Adam. And um, as a reminder to you guys, unless we have a volunteer for next week, we will have no talk next week. So please volunteer. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Adam, um, if, you want, if you want to join the uh, Comparing Electricity Options group, uh, Kelly, it's in the library conference room. Yeah, I, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for listening. All right, Tristan, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow.